Welcome to another episode of the Gospel Lifeline Podcast. My name is Neil Grogan here with Matthew Statler. We're back at it again, ready to begin a new series, a new direction, and a new subject matter. So, man, we're going into talk about my favorite flower, Matt. Can you guess what my favorite flower is? Roses. Close, but no cigar. The tulip, <laughs> which we know is an acronym or an acrostic, I guess, um, for one of the most hotly debated subject matters in all of Christendom um, and what we believe about God's sovereignty and man and salvation and man's responsibility. And um, there are two big camps, right? There's this reformed camp who affirms these doctrines of grace that we're going to spend the next several weeks talking about each one of those because we think just show our cards early we think these are the most faithful to what the scriptures teach uh, which is why we affirm them not because we affirm a system but because we believe the bible is teaching this clearly and plainly um, and then there is other groups who disagree with these core doctrines and um, those would be called arminian that's the arminian system um, and wherever you fall out on that line, either way, man, I want to tell you, that does not mean that you're not saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Like you can be a faithful follower of Jesus and affirm a different uh, system, um, and that's okay. But, you know, on our podcast, one of the things that Matt and I are very um, convicted about is we want to be in tune with what the Bible teaches and we can see the arguments for the other systems for sure. But, you know, when we look at the whole counsel of God's word, we believe that it's teaching emphatically these doctrines of grace. So today we're going to start with number one, the T of tulip, total depravity. Matt, you want to give us a kind of a brief overview of that? Yeah. And, and remember that this is not the sum and substance of the doctrines of grace or yeah. reform theology it is snapshot <laughs> it's a snapshot it's, it's actually the point of contention that the arminians had with um what some people call calvinism yeah um, and and i think this is important because this is really where the dis disagreement lies between two groups it's not so much this is what um, the full substance of the belief. Yeah. So the full, just keep that in mind. The doctrinal view, yeah. Yeah, a, 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 and the traditional full Arminian um, denies these these parts. And so the majority of people who call themselves Arminian really only disagree on one or two elements. Sure. Um, so the, the, the first one I think is the most verifiable, uh, which is total depravity. Um, mm -hmm. And so total depravity doesn't mean that you're um, as depraved as you possibly could be, uh, but it does mean that you are completely saturated uh, with this, uh, with sin, with wickedness. Matt, how would you define the word depravity? What does that mean? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like, when we think about the word depraved, you know, we think about uh, wicked people or um, someone who is just uh, terrible or wrong. Um, but I almost think of it more as like a wretch, uh, someone who has just been uh, beat down. They are in bondage to a particular uh, direction and it's just done nothing but make them filthy uh, so I would almost say depravity is um, uncleanness yeah. or or even uh, moral. Um, what would what would be the word? Uh, morally dirty. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah. that's kind of how I would try to make it in a simple, easy terms. Yeah, I would also add like unrighteous, you know, yeah. like um, I think one of the things you said was like, uh, uh, you know, morally, I didn't, you didn't say it this way, but basically morally blotched or your image that God has placed in you is marred because of sin. And, um, 
if we were to get down to brass tacks, what that means is because we have a nature of sin, we are depraved, we are dead in that sin, um, we therefore are unrighteous. Then there's no, you know, the the argument is there's no way to become righteous apart from Christ. And I would even say, like, uh, you know, this, of course, refers to sin and and so we are we have sin that has been totally distributed throughout our entire being yeah um not that we are completely saturated with sin but that we are it's totally distributed right inner so and outer man inner and outer man yeah and 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 we see that in the world right we we see people act in certain ways and their desires um, lead to more and more sin. And we see um, the world falling apart um, in certain areas, tornadoes and hurricanes and just destruction. Right. Um, doesn't mean that the whole world is a complete tornado. It just means that it's been distributed at, throughout the world. There is disease and, and all this throughout the whole creature. Um, yeah, I love like that. Cancer. I love that you said, <laughs> said it that way because one of the arguments against this doctrine is um, that what it implies or what it means then is that you are as evil as you could possibly be. And man, that's not what this doctrine teaches. That's not what we believe the Bible teaches. We know that God and his grace actually restrains evil in the world. So we are not as evil as we could be. There is an, there is a whole de another depth we could reach. Right. Um, uh, you know, think about some people, like Hitler, right? Not, we don't have uh, a million Hitlers, right? There was one Hitler. <laughs> um, but does that make anyone less guilty? Um, not on a soul level sense. Yeah. And, and I think another good example or an illustration is that of a sponge. And, and uh, Jim Oreck uh, writes about this, but he basically says it's like if you take a, a sponge and you soak it in vinegar. Even if you squeeze out all the vinegar, uh, it's still going to have the smell. And every all the water that you soak up with it will continue to have the smell or the, um, the vinegar aspect to it. And that's what we are. We are sponges. And it's not that we are filled with vinegar. It's just that every aspect of us is touched by this. And, and we get this from, um, from Scripture. Yeah. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. I think is very clear about this. Verse three, it says, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. And so um, Paul, as he's writing to the Ephesians, is just emphasizing, listen, we are following our fleshly desires, um, and those desires are tainted by the effects of sin. And so we um, are immediately inclined to sin. Yeah, you know, and I think like where where is the threshold, right? <laughs> and everything under is totally depraved. Everything other we would or over we would say is made righteous by God. And I think Romans 14, 23 kind of establishes this threshold and uh, for us. So we can, I think it's helpful for us to understand. It says anything that proceeds not from faith is sin. And so, man, that like covers a vast amount of territory, right? And so we have to look at a couple of things. Um, how does one have faith uh what does faith do therefore and what what does it imply then and so we would say if we've put our faith and our hope in jesus christ as lord and savior that he died in our place rose again from the grave three days later and are actively trusting and walking in his direction um, then we are saved we are declared righteous by the work of the son he takes our sin nature on himself and imputes or gives us his righteousness so that the father, when he sees us, he doesn't see a totally depraved wretch. He sees a righteous son or daughter, right? Made righteous by his son. And so if anything proceeds not from that position, you are in sin. So that implies several things. 
the first thing it implies is that our rebellion against God, Matt, is total. And it's <laughs> so why don't we talk about what that means? You know, you, you'd you like to talk a lot about the noetic effects uh, yeah. on man. And I think that's a great place uh, to kind of see how our rebellion against God is total. Yeah. And if we want to go all the way back to Genesis, we remember that we were created in God's image, right? Uh, we are we are created with a an immortal soul. Yep. <laughs> Human beings have an immortal soul that will never die. And um, when we talk about this total depravity, we're saying that it's corrupted uh, and it's been damaged. And so every aspect of it. And so if you talk about the heart or the, the inner man, when we talk about the inner man, there's three areas that typically um, are referred to in scripture. It's the understanding or the thinking. Um, if you want to get really fancy, we say cognitive, right? Um, the eff- the effective uh, feelings, and then um, the volition or the will. And so all three of those are affected by sin. And so we've talked a lot about our desires, or we could even say the will, um, and even the affections pull into that. But the cognitive or the understanding is also affected by uh, the fall, by sin. And so uh, we would say that this total depravity even affects our thinking. Um, And so the noetic effects of the fall um, are emphasizing the understanding and the thinking is corrupted. Uh, Mm -hmm. We are unable to come to the proper conclusions. And I think it's a uh, second Timothy that describes the coming to your senses um, aspect. And it's a uh, second Timothy two twenty six, And it says that, and, and then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Right. And so, um, God has to help us come to our senses in order to understand uh, the deeper things or, or to know God and to have this eternal life. But what we're saying is because of the noetic effects, the unbeliever can make true observations, but it's their interpretations that are what is um, infected or corrupted. Yeah, the unbeliever can even engage in religiousness or be philam- uh, ph- philanthropic, right? They do they, good things, yeah. Yeah, they do good things in the <laughs> world, but that does not mean that the motive or what is, what is proceeding out of the that desire is good. You know, I think about Romans 3, 9 through 11, Matt, which says... Um, well, really, we can start in verse 10. It's, you know, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away and all like have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. And so even though people do, as the world would describe as good things, right, in the general sense, because of the place that it comes from, it is selfishly engaged in, right? It's for an image. It's for influence. It's for power. It's, you know, the, it's not for a desire to make much of God. And because it doesn't come from a, a desire to make much of God, it is totally rebellious of uh, against him, right? It's, it's high treason, essentially. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, we could also talk about it in the sense of love. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not proceeding from love of God. It's love of self or love of the results or or some other love that's controlling the motive. Yeah. Uh, And so we're not saying that it's not a good thing that's been done or that it has doesn't accomplish good ends. But what we are saying is that according to Scripture, it is not good because it's motivated not by love. Yeah. And the love of the Lord. Yeah. And, you know, to give it like a sentence, uh, a short sentence, we was, we would say natural man. So apart from God, natural man does not seek God, period. Um, cannot, will not. His nature won't allow him to. Um, so that's kind of like the first aspect of to- 
total depravity, right? But there, there are more. I think there, are, you know, John Piper says there are four big things, <laughs> uh, aspects that we need to understand about total depravity, which I think are all faithful to the scripture. So that would be number one. Number two is that in our total depravity, in man's total rebellion, everything they do is sin. So again, you know, one of the things I, I quoted earlier was Romans 14, 23, Matt, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Therefore, if all men are in total rebellion, everything they do is the product of that rebellion, and it cannot be to honor God. It is only a part of their simple rebellion. So where are some some evidences we see this? Because that I loved how you started, Matt, with like, this is the most evidentiary of the doctrines of grace. Like we can look out at the world and see this is true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think about um, politicians, right? How many politicians take a poll before they go and they do something that's good or right. Um, or you think about your own children and there are, uh, we have a, a, a rule at our house that says obedience is all the way right away in a happy way. And um, which would then say that disobedience is done when by throwing a tantrum or being grumpy about it or throwing a fit when they're asked to do something. And we see that in the world today. I mean, how often do people do nice or good things um, from a legalistic perspective? Like this is I'm going to help you out because this is what is expected of me um you know and and you think about a marriage and if you came to your wife and you brought her some roses and you said hey uh, happy anniversary here's some roses because um i'm expected to do this mm. your your wife would be a little annoyed because you're not doing it because you love her you're doing it because it's a a rule or an expectation um, and so we see that naturally in our in our family and our kids uh, and in ourselves yeah, I love this illustration. It says if a if a king teaches his subjects how to fight well, and then those subjects rebel against their king and use the very skill he taught them to resist him, then even those skills as excellent and an, as amazing and as quote unquote good they are, they be, still become evil. And so when we say that man, people can still do good in the general sense, what we're saying is. Um, the good that most unbelievers do like not killing each other or performing acts of benevolence, right? What we mean when we call those actions good is that they more or less conform to the external patterns of the life that God has already commanded in scripture. So the King has still put those things on us. He's like morally imprinted us right with his image. And so when we don't kill, um, Man, that's a good thing in the general sense, but it still is. We still utilize um, our freedom in the sense of to sin and rebel against Him. Uh, so everything, therefore, that we do apart from Christ is still sin. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> uh, if Matt goes goes on after me, it's because I did. I was insufficient. <laughs> no. I just wanted no. to add my own two cents. Yeah, right. Um, so that's the second kind of aspect of total depravity we need to understand. The third is that man's inability to submit to God and do good is total. So this is a this is a contentious diverging point that Arminians and Calvinists would have um, at this point. What does the word inability mean, Matt? Unable, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, we Paul Paul talks about it the inability in the in the way he says we are enslaved. Yeah. Um, we're enslaved by the flesh, in particular. Romans eight has much to say about this. Um, in verses seven through eight, it says the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, cannot, uh -huh. unable, unable. Um, the, those who are in the flesh, they cannot, 
please God. <laughs> so when we talk about man's inability to submit to God and to do good based out of that preceding faith, um, they simply can't. They're unable to because they're a slave to their own flesh, their own nature, right? So let's describe that nature for a minute, Matt. How would you describe sin nature? Sin nature? Yeah. Um, I would say it. a sin nature is a inherited nature that is a corruption of the whole self. Yeah, um, I I think uh, one beautiful example that I've heard, and I think we've said on this podcast, Matt, um, to describe that in like a picture, is if you were to have a, a lion in a cage and you were to present him two bowls of food, one of meat and one of oatmeal, uh, which would the lion eat? Well, there is no scenario where the lion would eat oatmeal. He will always eat the meat because it is his nature to eat the meat. He's unable, unable to do anything otherwise because of his nature, his yeah. flesh. And so unless the lion's nature changes, there is no equation where he'll eat the oatmeal. And that's what we're talking about. God has to change our nature for us to move from the flesh to the spirit um, or to eat the oatmeal, right? And so when we talk about man's inability to submit to God and do good, it's it's totally consumed by it. Um, that's what we're talking about. The nature of man cannot submit. It only seeks to serve itself. Yeah, Jesus talks a lot about this. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard to miss in John 6, where in 44, it says, no one can come to me. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last days. Mm. I mean, it's that inability. And so something else has to act on that thing. I mean, it, and, and, you know, Ephesians <coughs> talks about being dead, right? We're dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses. We're being made alive. Um, I think the illustration of being completely dead uh, means that we are unable to make ourselves alive. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lazarus or, or the, the new birth, the new birth, right? Yeah. Being, being born, born again, uh, born again. And, and so, yeah, honestly, the, the Bible is very clear on this uh, total inability, total depravity, uh, you know, you name it, but you have a, a fourth point. Yeah. The fourth point is, uh, well then, then what, right? So if this is who man is, then what? Well, the fourth thing is that our rebellion, therefore, is totally deserving of God's wrath or eternal punishment. In Ephesians 2, 3, which Matt quoted earlier, it says, by nature, we are children of wrath. So to say that we're dead in, in our trespasses, our deadness, therefore, means that we are children of wrath, deserving of wrath. So I always think about like the fair argument people people say, um, you know, Matt, like what about the guy on the island who never heard the gospel, never had a, an opportunity to respond in faith? You know, what would we say of that guy? Does he deserve death? Well, we say, yes, based upon his sin nature, his, his natural rebellion against God, he's totally deserving of God's wrath, just as you and I are apart from Christ. There's no equation for us um, <laughs> based on fairness to get anything else. Um, that's what every human being who's ever lived deserves outright. And so what does that mean when we receive grace then? Uh, Matt, how, what, wh why does that make grace so much more beautiful? Yeah, well, it's not based on anything in or from us. Mm. Um, and so it provides, I mean, I think a huge level of humility, uh, and thankfulness that the Lord saw fit to do this, to do this thing in us. And, and Neil, I, I've wrestled with this concept a lot before as well, mm -hmm. um, because I, I yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it, the reason we do 
is because we have an experience and our experience is that of coming to Christ and surrendering our lives to him. And we, we reap the benefits of that point. Yeah. So I think many of us will base our understanding solely on experience and then look to the scriptures to then validate. Yeah. Uh, but if we think about it in the terms of birth, um, we recognize that we may come to a realization that this is what has happened to us. I come to our senses. Come to our senses. Yeah. Um, but we did not give ourselves life. Yeah. So by we surrender for because we were first made able to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if we understand scripture correctly, which I think is a very clear um teaching. I mean, many, many more texts, yeah, clear teaching. So um, you know, as I wrestle through my experience of coming to the Lord and surrendering and, and stuff like that, um, I need to recognize there was something happening underneath the surface before. I came to my senses in that. Um, and I think that's helpful. And it has implications for how we evangelize. Yeah. Um, it has implications for when someone sins grievously against us. Uh, we can recognize the depravity of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. It should produce in the believer an urgency um, to go because we do not know who the Lord will change their heart, will change that nature uh, from dead to life. Um, But we know that God has called uh, his children to be the vehicles of his message. Um, And so we should look at this, this understanding of human nature, having a right anthropology. Um, What it should do is produce in us an urgent desire to go and proclaim the message of freedom to the captives. Because when we understand that people are dead and enslaved in bondage to their sin, the only way they can be made free is by Christ. Um, that is the solution to all issues in this world, uh, yeah. period. And so, ma'am, our hope, Matt and my hope, is that you'll hear this, you'll have a right understanding of who you were before Christ or who you are apart from Christ. And um, if you are in Christ, then you will run to people um, and desire to sit with them and talk with them and uh, preach the message of Jesus to those who are perishing, who who will have the infinite wrath of God poured out on their heads in hell in a real sense. Um, the Bible is clear on, on punishment as well. Uh, so in summary, we would say this. Total depravity means that our rebellion against God is total, that everything we do in that rebellion is sinful, that our inability to submit to God or reform ourselves is total. We can't change ourselves. And lastly, we therefore are totally deserving of eternal punishment. That is the doctrine of total depravity in a nutshell. You know, <laughs> there are books upon books written on this subject matter, and we just did 28 minutes on it. So um, we'd encourage you to to dive in more and more on this. Seek the scriptures for yourself. Test what we've said. Uh, read God's word. Love God's word. Try to understand yourself in light of what God's word teaches, because that is the only way you will have clear lenses to see um, your reality or the, the reality of the world in it. Well, guys, next week, we're going to talk about unconditional election, which is the next doctrine of grace. And we look forward to that conversation as well. Until next time, Matt and Neil, we out.